When the Guy family met for Thanksgiving, they knew it would be the last holiday in the family home. Unfortunately, it would also be their last holiday ever. The parents were planning to retire, and their house had finally sold. However, retirement meant no longer financially supporting their adult son as they had been. When their son learned he would have to get a job in order to maintain the lifestyle he had been enjoying, he began to develop his own plan. The scene he left in his wake was nothing short of a horror show. This is the gruesome case of Joel Michael Guy Jr. Joel Guy Sr. and Lisa Madeer were married for 31 years and described as true soulmates. Joel Sr. had three daughters from a previous marriage when he met Lisa. They married in 1985 and had one son, Joel Michael Guy Jr., in 1988. Did you have an opportunity to observe her relationship with uh, your brother? Yes. And what was their relationship like? It was great. <laughs> I mean, they just, they, they do just fit, you know? They were meant to be together. She was excited about retiring and just spending her time. They were madly in love, so just spending time with each other. Lisa had been like a second mother to Joel Sr.'s three daughters, and it was clear that the love shared between the girls and Lisa was immeasurable. In court, the daughters described how much they looked up to their stepmother who treated them as her own. Lisa's been in my life my entire life, and they had said it three, but I didn't, she's been my entire memory. And so we would go in the summers, um, my dad would have us for a month in the summer because they li always lived so far away and Angela and I would go visit for the entire month. But our the dynamics of that was my mom was a single mom, so there's struggles with single moms. But when we went to Lisa's house, her um, cabinets were stocked with food and she greeted dad like the perfect Walton family. When they would come home, dinner would be cooked with meat and side dishes and there would be um, candy in the shelves and I just would watch her and I watched her growing up like she was the mom or that dream that you have to have a single not a single home excuse me a double parent home to where she loved like I so wanted to be this woman that my first engagement ring was her exact engagement ring and I wanted to be the mom she was I wanted to she would sit in her little brown fairy brown shirt she had a really high arch in her foot and just with her cup. I wanted to even, at certain points in my life, I walked around with a cup that had like the little square um, placement under it um, because I wanted to be her. I wanted to be the mom that she was. How, how that came about? Um, Lisa, when Michelle and I uh, were three, they met and she's been like a second mother to us since before I can remember. <laughs> During their testimonies, the daughters recalled how often they would communicate with Joel Sr. and Lisa. They were all in a group text together and would regularly call and text each other. Lisa and Dad were my best friends, they said. And, uh, can you describe your relationship with Lisa? With Lisa, she was one of my best friends. And so was Dad. Um, can you describe for the jury a little bit your relationship with Lisa and uh, your dad? I was, we were very close, like friends, like best friends. They they were my best friends. And 
Did you communicate with them regularly? Yes, ma'am. And we had a group text. It was more, the text was banter, just funny. Even through email, Dad would send banter of funniness. Okay. And how often would you all communicate together? Um, weekly, if not daily, but weekly. Joel Michael was more distant than his half-sisters, choosing to spend time away from the family, even during holidays at home with his parents. When his parents decided to move from Louisiana to Tennessee, Joel Michael chose to stay behind at a boarding school. Family said they only saw him around the holidays. However, even when Joel Michael was around, he would usually keep to himself, preferring to stay in his room the entire time. 27 years, or however old he was, he stayed in his bedroom. He was never smiling, saying, let me give you something. Now, did you have a relationship with your nephew, the defendant? No, just when he come in for holidays. Okay. Do you know your nephew very well? No. And no, I really don't. And that's, he... He never was around. He lived in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, yeah. is that right? Joel Sr. had worked as a pipeline engineer, and Lisa took a job as a human resources accounts payable administrator. While Joel Sr.'s three daughters moved out, went to university, and began starting their own families, Joel Michael headed to college, first attending George Washington University in D.C. before landing in Baton Rouge, Louisiana to attend Louisiana State University, where he would study to be a plastic surgeon. Though Joel Michael continued his academics for nearly a decade, he never held a job, choosing to rely on his parents for financial support. As the years passed, Joel Sr. became frustrated that his son still had no degree. When Joel Sr. made the decision to cut his son off, Lisa took the administrator job so she could continue to send money to her son. Lisa loved her son and would pay for everything, from school tuition to his car and apartment. It's been an ongoing family conversation and knowledge. Um, I know Dad had cut Joel Michael off probably years before, and the only reason why Lisa ever had a job, because she didn't need to work, was to solely take her check and provide it to Joel Michael so he didn't need to work. As Joel Sr. and Lisa made plans to retire, they knew they would have to tell their son that he would have to start finding his own way. The couple had listed their home for sale, and the family said they had already talked to Joel Michael about finding a job in the month before Thanksgiving. Joel Sr.'s sister, Robin, testified that Lisa planned to tell Joel Michael that she was no longer paying his bills at Christmas when he had planned to drive up, but he surprised everyone by coming up for Thanksgiving. Well, the week before, they were at the house and we were talking about what they were going to do, and they said that they were going to wait till Christmas to talk to Joel Michael, that they were going to have to have him to start paying his bills and stuff. Uh, Did they, you all have plans for Christmas? Yes. What were the plans? Everybody was going to meet at the house. And Joel Michael would be in for Christmas. They said he wasn't coming in for Thanksgiving. Michael. Yes. My brother had stated to me that uh, he was uh, retiring and moving up, and he had cut his son off from any money, anything. He was tired of keeping him up. And Lisa was fixing, they was fixing to move in the family home, and Lisa was fixing to cut him off and when come Christmas when he was supposed to come in. But he came in for Thanksgiving instead. Thanksgiving of 2016 fell on the 24th of November, and the Guy family gathered to celebrate. 
The family home sat picture perfect in a beautiful neighborhood in Knoxville, Tennessee. Outside, a for sale sign stood out front on the manicured lawn, while inside, the walls were lined with photos of loved ones. This would be the last holiday hosted in the home, and to everyone's surprise, Joel Michael drove up from Baton Rouge to join his parents and one of his half-sisters, Michelle, for the occasion. Originally, Joel Michael had planned to wait and spend Christmas with the family instead. Joel Sr. and Lisa were overjoyed to learn that their home in Knoxville had finally sold, and they had already begun the process of buying Joel Sr.'s childhood home in Sargoinsville, Tennessee. They would be moved into the new home before Christmas. Joel Sr. had already retired from his job, while Lisa still had a week left. As the family stood around chatting and laughing, Michelle noticed unusual behavior from Joel Michael. Instead of shutting himself in his room, he was participating. Joel Michael was chatty and upbeat, even taking his nephews upstairs to give away some of his childhood toys. Michelle said it was so odd to see Joel Michael interacting with her boys that she felt she needed to check on them occasionally. Thanksgiving was different. The um, Thanksgiving was completely different. The moment that I um, arrived, Joel Michael Jr. was um, talking to us, and so, and he had never. I, I'm not sure Joel Michael Jr. knew my kids' names, and so, um, it, for him to talk to them was was odd. And so he was talking to my kids, and he was bringing them upstairs. They had. Lisa had kept every single thing that this kid had that, I mean, he wasn't a kid at that point, but his entire everything, beanie babies that he had collected, things that he had put on the shelf like eggs, science stuff, and she uh, memorabilized, it's not a word, memorialized, I'm not going to know the word right now, memorialized, no. Memorialized. Yes, that word. Um, his, ent his entire life in boxes upstairs. And so they were bringing those boxes down, but it wasn't Lisa giving that away. Lisa wouldn't, Lisa didn't want to give it away. Um, it was Joel Michael giving, Joel Michael Jr. giving it to my boys, which was still odd. Though his demeanor seemed positive, Michelle said it felt like there was a little bit of tension in the air. Her father mentioned that Lisa had spoken to Joel Michael about supporting himself and it had been causing tension in the house. There was a little bit of tension, and so when everyone was inside and it was just... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was just me and Dad, Dad and myself that was bad grammar. It was just um, me and Dad. Um, we were out on the porch, and he said that Lisa hadn't told Joel Michael and that you could... Um, you could feel like that that was what was causing the little bit of tension inside the house. That, um, that you could feel the tension. Okay. It was a did, he, bit. did he say anything specifically about them withdrawing financial support from your brother? That's what he said he had told, that he had told Joel Michael <laughs> about the, um, that he had told, that they had told Joel Michael about um, him having to get a job or, or being cut off, but he didn't, I can't remember his correct verbiage, but it wasn't cut off. It's that they couldn't afford to support him, support him any longer. Okay. Joel Michael's behavior wasn't the only thing Michelle noticed as out of the ordinary. That morning, as she had been unloading her car in the driveway, she saw two large blue plastic totes in the back seat of her brother's car. She thought it was a strange way to carry luggage, but shrugged it off, having other things to worry about. When I had pulled in, I had pulled in for my car to be right there so I could carry all of these clothes upstairs to his um, washer and dryer, but in walking past um, Joel Michael's car, there was this big totes in the back 
and the lids were on them and um, one was inside the other but I thought he had carried his luggage in my, my brain what my brain thought um, or my first reaction was that his luggage was in that car why he had carried that's the reason I remembered it why did he put his luggage why does he not have luggage mm-hmm. as the evening wound down Michelle and her family headed home for the night the next day Joel Sr. and his son were going to drive the family's boat up to the house in Sir Goinsville. Joel Sr. told his sisters, Renee and Robin, they were going to head up to the new house with the boat, do a little cleaning, and head back to Knoxville around 3 p.m. to be home in time for dinner. The Saturday and Sunday after Thanksgiving, Renee and Michelle both tried to reach out to Joel Sr. and Lisa. Michelle had texted them to request a photo they had taken during Thanksgiving, but she received no response. Renee had also tried to call and text Joel Sr. and Lisa over the course of the weekend, but she too never heard back. Their worry grew as Monday arrived, and they still had not heard anything from the couple. Joel Sr. and Lisa were usually very responsive to calls and text messages, and to go days without any replies was unheard of. Another daughter, Chandis, knew that something had to be terribly wrong. Besides speaking to her dad nearly every weekend, Sunday had been her birthday, something her father would have never missed. Did you hear from your father or communicate with him at all uh, on Saturday, November the 26th or Sunday, November the 27th? No. And did that surprise you? It did. And why did it surprise you? Because Sunday was my birthday. Did you expect a call from your father on that day? Yes. Did you find it unusual that he did not call? It was the first birthday I ever missed. Michelle tried calling and texting again, but the phones were now going to voicemail. She told her sister she would drive over and check on them after work if she still had not heard anything from them. Meanwhile, Lisa's supervisor, Jennifer Whited, immediately noticed that Lisa hadn't arrived for her shift at 7 a.m. Jennifer liked to give her employees a 15-minute grace period to arrive, but when 7.15 rolled around, she asked Lisa's group if they had heard anything from her. No one had spoken to Lisa that morning, and Jennifer's text messages weren't getting any replies. So I began texting her and she didn't text back. And I thought that was um, highly unusual. Um, A lot of thoughts went through my mind, you know, hoping that she was okay, hoping that, you know, this was her last week. She was retiring, that she had blown us off. Um, But I knew that wasn't right. Um, So I continued to text her. I continued to text Joel Sr. I called um, and never did get an answer. Would that have been unlike her to not show up for work and not oh, to call. Oh, absolutely. If, if she couldn't make it to work, she would have called me immediately. And is, do I understand you to say that you also attempted to call her husband? I did. All right. And how many times would you say you called or texted? I lost track of how many times, but I, I kept doing it thinking this time they're going to answer. Um, I would say at least 20, at least. Jennifer knew that this was very unlike Lisa, who would have made sure to call and let her know that she wasn't going to be in. She continued to text Lisa and Joel Sr. and even tried calling. As Jennifer grew more concerned, she placed a call to the police and requested a welfare check. On Monday, November 28, 2016, at 9.38 a.m., with a GMT offset of negative 300 minutes, 
Agent ID is extension is 203. Uh, yes, I have an employee that um, has not reported for work today and highly unlike her. I've tried calling her home number, I've tried calling her cell phone and can't get a hold of her. What can we do about that? Can somebody go by and check on them? Yeah, do you know her address? I do, I do. It, it is 11434 Golden View Lane. My name is Jennifer Whited, W-H-I-T-E-D. And what company are you in? Jacobs Engineering. And what's a good call back for you guys? It is 865-216-6625. Lisa Guy, G-U-Y. Her husband's name is Joel, J-O-E-L. Should he be there too? Does he live with her? Yes, he does. Okay. And they do have a, a dog named Jake. I think he's a big baby. in her, oh, I think, late 50s. Do you know if she has any medical issues? No. I mean, she has high blood pressure, but that's all. That's all that I know of. Yeah. And I know that their house is for sale, and they are moving, and she is leaving our company, but that's supposed to be Friday, and this definitely isn't like her just not to show up. Bye-bye. Officer Stephen Ballard responded to the welfare check at the Guy family residence. When he first arrived, he noted that there was a for sale sign in the front yard and the family vehicles were sitting in the driveway. He knocked on the front door and rang the doorbell, but no one answered. As he made his way around the left side of the house, he saw a short fence around the backyard, and in the yard was a doghouse. Officer Ballard whistled, but there was no sign of a dog anywhere. He returned to the front door and rang the doorbell a second time. Though the door had a large window, he did not peer through because it was considered an officer safety issue. After a while of trying to make contact with the residents and not finding anything particularly suspicious, he left. When Jennifer didn't hear back from the police and still hadn't gotten a response from Lisa and Joel Sr., she called the police again. As she spoke to them a second time, they told her nothing seemed out of place at the guy residence. Knowing that something was very wrong, she asked them to send officers back out to the house, explaining that Lisa had made plans with co-workers that day and it would have been extremely out of character for Lisa to have blown them off. Um, I had realized that nobody had called me, still could not get a hold of uh, Lisa or, or Joel, so I called back to see what they had found with the welfare check. And um, I was told that everything seemed to be fine, that nothing looked out of the place, and so they, they didn't do anything further. I asked them to please go back because I knew that um, something was not right. She had plans with other co-workers today, or that day, and um, that she would not have canceled or just blown them off. She would have, she would have at least called. So I asked them to go back. And what is the next thing you heard in response to your request? 
Um, I was told that they would talk to a detective to see what they thought and they would get back with me. And what happened next? It was probably 20 to 30 minutes later, I think, um, that I got a phone call from a detective wanting to ask me more questions about Lisa and, and what I what I knew. But I did not know that anything in particular had happened. About an hour or so after Officer Ballard had returned to patrolling, he received a call from Detective McCord asking about what he'd seen while checking the guy residence. The detective asked that Officer Ballard return to the house with him to investigate further. When officers arrived back at the house, they spoke to the neighbors to determine when they had last seen the guys. Now that concern was rising for the couple, one of the officers looked through the front door window and saw what appeared to be bags of groceries scattered around the floor of the foyer. Officers moved around the left side of the house and climbed over the fence into the backyard. As they approached the back porch, they realized that the doorknob was missing from the back door, leaving a noticeable hole. Detective McCord peered through the door where the knob had been. He explained in court that he detected heat and chemical odor emanating from the door. Even more concerned now, officers quickly made their way back around to the front of the house where they managed to get the garage door raised by using a remote found inside one of the vehicles. As they entered the garage, they immediately noticed the intense heat radiating from inside. The officers announced themselves and made their way into the house through the interior garage door. They found themselves standing in a kitchen with several bottles of chemicals sitting on the floor. The lights were on and there was a large stock pot on the stove, obviously boiling. Somewhere deeper in the house, a dog could be heard howling. The heat was oppressive and Officer Ballard stated that his face had begun to tingle as soon as he entered the house. They began to move through the house, weapons drawn, calling out for the guys. Moving towards the front of the house, Officer Ballard noticed several long guns on the dining room table as he made his way into the foyer where the grocery bags lay abandoned. Stains consistent with blood speckled the walls and the carpet of the stairway that led to the upstairs landing. They moved cautiously up the stairs as the heat became more intense and the howling grew louder. At the top of the stairs was a child safety gate, and beyond that sat more containers of chemicals, a pile of clothing, and large dark stains on the carpet. The landing opened up into a hallway with several rooms to both sides. It became immediately clear that something truly gruesome had occurred. And that's where I noticed the hands at the end of the hallway. Of course, that's where dog is. Knives. Blood, hands. Is that people's hands? Yeah, 
I think so. That's what I see. That's what it looks like. Uh, fucking hand. Get out of there. I ain't cleared this. We not cleared this. There's blood all over it, though. You want to... You can't. Back out. Uh. At the end of the hallway were a pair of human hands. Coupled with the horrors of the master bathroom, the officers quickly retreated to call for the forensic team. Inside the guy residence, the thermostat had been set to 90 degrees. Heaters blew on their highest setting throughout the house. On the small kitchen table was a hammer and two wallets belonging to Joel Sr. and Lisa. Several bottles of bleach, a bulk bag of baking soda, and a bleach sprayer sat nearby on the floor along with a pile of towels and a roll of trash bags. The sink was filled with what appeared to be water and at the bottom was the front door doorknob with the realtor lockbox still attached. The doorknob had been removed and replaced with the now missing back door doorknob. A large stock pot boiled on the stove unattended. In the dining room, the other half of the front door, doorknob, and multiple long guns rested on the table, arranged like inventory, along with several cases of ammunition and more guns on the floor. The Walmart bags scattered around the floor of the foyer contained perishables as if someone were called away as soon as they entered the front door and was unable to return. Surveillance footage taken from the local Walmart showed Lisa Guy purchasing these items before returning home. A small blood trail grew as it led from the foyer and up the stairs to the landing. Lisa's clothing lay in a pile at the top of the stairs, partially obscuring a large, bloody kitchen knife. Her clothes were riddled with jagged holes where she had been stabbed repeatedly with the knife, and they had been cut off of her body afterward. Discarded next to the clothing, a gold ring. The carpet around the clothing was stained with blood. There were multiple tubs of sewer line cleaner and a bottle of lye stacked nearby, emptied of their corrosive liquids. Officers found the dog locked in the laundry room upstairs. He was tired and dehydrated, but otherwise unharmed. At the end of the hallway was a workout room that sat above the garage downstairs. On the floor, next to an overturned workout machine, were two disarticulated hands with multiple defensive wounds across the palms. A pile of men's clothing in similar condition to those found in the hallway laid next to several bloodstains on the carpet and two large kitchen knives. Heavy blood stains covered the walls and floor in the corner. The hallway bathroom was littered with discarded rubber gloves and bloodied bandages. 
On the counter was a black combat knife. Clothes had also been discarded in this room, but it was clear that these belonged to a younger man. Next to the bathroom was a guest bedroom. Inside, luggage remained on the floor next to the bed, containing clothes similar to those left in the guest bathroom floor. An open and on laptop sat plugged up on the bed as if it had been left while still in use. On the other side of the bed was a maroon backpack containing several books and a large black notebook. Two blue plastic tote lids were found in the bedroom and on the dresser was a box of rubber gloves and a bloody bottle of hydrogen peroxide. In the master bedroom, a roll of plastic sheeting was found on the bed, already missing a large section. More bottles of drain cleaner and hydrogen peroxide were scattered around the floor next to packages of gloves and brand new blender components. The rest of the plastic sheeting lined the entirety of the master bathroom. A green garden hose ran down from where the shower head would have been. In the sink was another large kitchen knife next to more gloves. Two large blue plastic totes sat side by side in the middle of the bathroom floor. Inside were the rest of the remains of Joel Sr. and Lisa. Both had been dismembered into several pieces which sat in a corrosive bath of chemicals described by prosecutors as a diabolical stew of human remains. The remains of Joel Sr. had been separated at the shoulders and hips. His hands were missing. They had been found in the workout room at the end of the hallway upstairs. Most of his skin had been eaten away, leaving only the skin on his back and one of his feet as they had been above the surface of the liquid. His head had been skeletonized, and the flesh on his limbs had been dissolved down to the bone. The autopsy found that he had been stabbed at least 34 times in the back. He also sustained at least five stab wounds to the front of his torso and appeared to be partially disemboweled by a large cut along his abdomen. Lisa Guy suffered a similar fate. She had been decapitated, her arms removed at the shoulders, and her legs at the knees. Her back had also been above the corrosive liquid leaving it relatively well preserved compared to the rest of her remains. She had been stabbed at least 25 times in the back and she also had a large wound across her abdomen. Her head was found in the large pot of boiling liquid on the stove downstairs and did not seem to have any contact with the chemicals used on the rest of the remains, as it was still intact and only showed signs of heat exposure rather than chemical. Immediately, Investigators began putting together a picture of what happened in the house the weekend after Thanksgiving. Detectives spoke with Michelle Tyler to learn that her family had not been the only ones to visit the Guy residence in the days prior. She told officers that her half-brother, Joel Michael, had driven up to visit from Baton Rouge and had stayed there over the weekend. A Walmart receipt matching the groceries in the foyer was found in Lisa's purse and it was time-stamped 
for November 26, 2016 at 12.18 p.m. Surveillance footage shows Lisa at the Walmart register and exiting the store by around 12.19 p.m. Investigators also found a Walmart receipt in the upstairs guest bathroom. The receipt was consistent with the items found around the bathroom and showed the purchase was also made on the 26th of November, just a few hours after the first receipt at 3.35 p.m. When the surveillance video was reviewed, the guy's only son, Joel Michael could be seen browsing the pharmacy and purchasing first aid supplies. In the video, Joel Michael's hands appeared to be bandaged in multiple places. Officers were also able to get his license plate number from the parking lot cameras. Though the footage was incriminating, it was nothing compared to the large black notebook left behind in Joel Michael's backpack. Inside, investigators found homework and printouts that clearly belonged to Joel Michael. The prosecution would call the several pages of the notebook that detailed how Joel Michael planned to murder his parents, dispose of their bodies, and eventually obtain their assets and life insurance money, his book of premeditation. He wrote, Get rid of bodies inside house. Get carving knives to make small pieces. Get knives quiet, multiple, 
Get plastic sheeting for disposal process. Get bleach, denature proteins. Get plastic bin for denaturation process. Turn heater up as high as it goes. Speeds decomposition. Wear gloves and socks to prevent fingerprints and footprints. Place her in shower. Turn on hot water and point at her to get rid of forensics. Remove her clothes and take them with me for disposal. Get sledgehammer, crush bones. Bring blender and food grinder, grind meat. Place hair curler with flammable paper and flammable containers of gasoline in four locations. Timer for flammables set for Friday at 10 a.m. Sunlight masks fires, but not smoke. Everyone at work so they can't report it. To get rid of blood, use peroxide, hemoglobin, and bleach, DNA. Bleach reacts with luminol just like blood. Douse everything with bleach. Big sprayer. Clean up mess from him before she gets home. He's not alive to claim her half of the insurance. Money. All mine. $500,000. Investigators concluded that Joel Michael had been planning the murders for quite some time. Evidence showed that he had started purchasing items that were found at the crime scene 19 days before the murders were committed. According to Joel Michael's own notes, he was going to wait for his mom to leave for the store before killing his father. He attacked Joel Sr. in the workout room upstairs. There was a violent struggle, leaving a workout machine overturned and Joel Michael's hands severely injured with deep cuts to his thumb and palm. Once his father was dead, he waited for his mother to return. When she got home, he called her upstairs where he would kill her as well. Afterward, he cut their clothes away where they lay before starting the process of dismembering their bodies. The blood trail leading down the stairs was likely a result of Joel Michael carrying his mother's decapitated head to the kitchen. Forensics on the guy's phones and home computer indicated that several thousand dollars had been taken out of Joel Sr.'s bank account and paid to Louisiana State University. It was on, on 11-27, November 27, uh, 2016, at 9.38 a.m., there was an inbound text message from the number 872265, uh, and it was read and the message was U.S. Bank Alerts, card not present alert. Your card, 5773, was charged $2,051.03 at Bursar Operations to opt out, text stop. Uh, there was one following behind that at 9 40. I'm sorry, I read, I'm reading these backwards. That was at 9.41 and 29 seconds. There was one just before that at 9.40 and 2 seconds, U.S. Bank alerts, card not present alert, your card 5773 was charged $1,589.78 at Bursar Operations to opt out text stop. And then just before that one on 11-27-2016 at 9.38 and 26 seconds a.m., there was a red text message that said, U.S. Bank Alerts, card not present alert. Your card, 5773, was charged $1,025 at Bursar Operations to opt out, text, stop. That was the last of the, that was the three text messages that I noted. And those text messages came in on what date, sir? Bursar Operations, uh, when I looked into that, I found that that belongs to LSU. So that, uh, 
uh, a Capital One alerting individual that LSU, the money was transferred to LSU through that credit card number. Okay. And what date was those, were those text messages? I'm sorry, what? What date were those text messages? What date did they come in? The date uh, those text messages those text messages was November 27th, 2016. These transactions took place after Joel Sr. and Lisa were murdered. Another purchase was made using a different card for just over $3,000. It was also apparent that Joel Michael intended to steal several bottles of prescription medication such as oxycodone and tramadol. On Sunday, Joel Michael traveled back to Baton Rouge to receive treatment for the injuries to his hands. He had meant to return to collect his belongings and finish disposing of the crime scene, but when he drove back to Knoxville, he found that he was too late and the house had already been surrounded by police tape. Unable to access the house, he returned to Baton Rouge, forced to abandon his plans and his luggage. A warrant was issued for Joel Michael's arrest and the Knox County Police coordinated with the Baton Rouge Police to find him. Officers arrested him at his apartment on November 29th as he walked to his car. The trial began September 28th, 2020. Though Joel Michael pled not guilty to the murder of his parents, he filed a motion with the court to sentence him to death if he were found guilty. During the four-day trial, Joel Michael's defense team offered no evidence to the court. The prosecution called Joel Michael's sisters and aunts to the stand to testify, as well as his former roommate. The court was shown graphic, photo, and video evidence, and the medical examiner described the state the bodies were found in. Officers who worked on the investigation presented multiple murder weapons, the blue plastic totes, and the black notebook containing the Book of Premeditation. During the trial, Joel Michael seemed unmoved by the graphic depictions of his parents' murders. He sat in court with a bored expression on his face while occasionally smiling and quietly joking with his attorneys. Jurors took two days to reach a verdict. They found Joel Michael Guy Jr. guilty of seven charges two counts of premeditated first-degree murder, three counts of felony murder, and two counts of abuse of a corpse. Judge Stephen Sword sentenced Joel Michael to life in prison. He would not be receiving the death penalty he was hoping for. Um, he left their bodies to cool off, you know? Because he was hurt, and he had to go take care of himself. Do you remember seeing Lisa's purse on that? It was the kitchen table, not the dining room table, and her wallet. He had, he had done that, okay? The police didn't do that. The defendant had gone through her purse and had taken out her wallet and, and his father's wallet, and he got money, okay? He needed cash. Lisa Guy paid for the medical supplies that he bought to treat his hands that he hurt when he was killing his father. And then she says, calmly as you please, he goes to the Walmart, he, uh, he goes through the, uh, the doors, and he goes to the medical part department, and he buys his bandages, and he buys hydrogen peroxide, two bottles of it, two big bottles of uh, rubbing alcohol, because you know what? Rubbing alcohol and peroxide in small, even, even small bottles can destroy evidence. They can clean your wounds, but they can also clean things off. 
like that K-bar knife, for example, that's on the, uh, on the uh, bathroom counter. She paid for his medical supplies. She paid for all of this, okay? Because she was supporting him. And think about that. She paid for the drain cleaner she was dissolved in. She paid for the muriatic acid. She paid for the work lights that he thought he was going to need. She paid for the sledgehammer. She paid for the timers. She paid for the plastic sheeting. She paid for that garden hose. She paid for the small sprayer in the master bathroom. She paid for the big sprayer, the bleach sprayer that was left in the floor of the kitchen. She paid for those garbage bags. She paid for his socks. She paid for his red potato salad that he got when he was buying his medical supplies because he worked up an appetite after all of that and he was in the mood for some red potato salad. Think about that. <laughs> Think about that. She paid for the tubs that she and her husband disintegrated in. She worked all those years at Jacob Engineering to put him up, to keep him in his lifelong whatever program he's in at LSU. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? She was still looking for a job in Sergoinsville. Do you remember Renee Charles telling you that? She wasn't going to cut him off. She was going to find a job up there. She was going to keep supporting him. Oh, my goodness. She gave him everything he wanted. And then she had the nerve, the nerve, uh, to tell him that uh, they retired and needed a break.